Hey Ravens, I hope you're enjoying a nice, warm, and cozy holiday break. I'll be reading from Poisoned by Jennifer Donnelly. We still want to lose our momentum and find out what happens to Sophie. Chapter 38. The sun was rising. Its pale golden rays slanted through the tree limbs. And across the forest floor, Sophie and Will had broken camp an hour ago after a quick breakfast of bread and cheese. They'd be walking ever since. Will suddenly stopped dead. He often did that when they heard something or saw something remarkable. Sophie knew that now. The first few times she'd crashed into him on the narrow forest path. Did you hear that? He asked. It's a kestrel. She's overhead. Will looked up. His eyes followed the bird as she darted through the air, probably looking for a tasty wren for her breakfast. Sophie wasn't looking at the bird, she was looking at him. He loved the forest and its creatures. She'd discovered and he'd made the long, boring walk interesting, pointing out animals, tracks, and woodland flowers. He was a puzzle, a very different creature to the boys at court who constantly flirted and flattered and were absolutely allergic to silence. He was a quietly kind boy, one who spoke only when he had something to say. Sophie had learned this almost immediately. Where do you live? She'd asked him shortly after they'd set off. In the woods. Do you have a family? Yes. Why are you going to Grasseldorf? Need some things. After a while, she'd given up and had just trudged behind him silently. She had better things to do than chat anyway, like figure out how she was going to get all the way to Scandinavia on foot with no money. Five precious days had passed since she'd left the hollow which gave her a little over three weeks until the clockworks inside her stopped. Sophie felt as if she were standing inside a giant hourglass, desperately trying to keep the sand from pouring down on her. She needed help if she was going to complete her journey, that much was clear. She needed a supply of food and she needed to take the quickest route to the border. Will was a good shot. He seemed to know every inch of the woods. As Sophie walked along, staring at his back, she wondered if he would take her to Hakon's palace. She had no doubt that Hakon would reward Will richly for returning his intended to him, but she wasn't sure that Will would agree to do it. She decided to wait a little, to get to know him a bit better before she asked him. They continued on after Will spotted the kestrel walking through the dense woods and up and down hills for hours. They'd just made their way into a valley and Will had suggested that they take a break to rest and eat when out of nowhere a voice said, Stop, right there, hands up, don't move. Will did as he was told. Sophie, looking around wildly for the one who'd spoken, followed his lead. A man stepped out of the trees. He was holding a knife. Sophie swallowed fearfully. She glanced around. More men emerged from the woods. They gathered around Sophie and Will. Beyond them, hidden deep in the trees, stood half a dozen canvas tents, their sides covered with brush, a campfire burned in front of one. Neither she nor Will had smelled it because the wind was carrying the smoke away from them. Sophie realized that she and Will had stumbled into an encampment. She squinted in the gloom and saw that a group of men, some young, some older, sat on logs that they'd drawn up to the fire. They all wore dark blue jackets that were faded but brushed and tidy, and they all appeared to be injured. One man's arm was in a sling. A boy no more than 15 or 16 had lost both eyes. A drum lay at his feet. Another man, thin as a wraith, shivered convulsively by the fire. Yet another sat slightly away from it on a chair with an elongated seat that somehow had fashioned from tree limbs. The seat supported what was left of his legs. Who will walk? Who will? Who walked? with his bow over his arm, always at the ready, led one of his hands and let it dip down toward the quiver to draw an arrow. I wouldn't, boy, the man with the knife cautioned, not unless you're sure that arrow can get to me before this knife gets to you. Will let the arrow slide through his fingers and dropped back into the quiver. He raised his hands high again. We're just passing through, he said. We don't want any trouble. Don't give none and you won't get none, said the man. He mentioned... He motioned to the path ahead with the tip of his dagger. On your way? Will nodded. He and Sophie lowered their hands. Will grabbed the sleeve of her jacket and tried to hurry her along, but Sophie's steps were slow and stumbling because she couldn't take her eyes off the men. Those jackets, the tents, the orderly campsite, she thought. Why are they out here? 
She'd seen these things before, riding with her stepmother as she drilled her troops. Her gaze settled on the man, thin and ashen-faced, who was shivering by the fire. Impulsively, she broke free of Will's grasp. What are you doing, Sophie? He told us to go. But that man by the fire, he's ill. We should help him. Will gave an ugly snort. Do as you like. I'm leaving. I want nothing to do with these men. Sophie looked at him, taken aback by the emotion in his voice. Why would you say that? She asked. They wear the queen's uniform. I despise the queen, the princess, their so-called nobles, and all the thieves and murderers who make up the Greenland's god-forsaken army. Sophie felt as if she'd, he'd slapped her. Will, kind, quiet Will, hated her, the real her, and she had no idea why. Will didn't notice her reaction. He was still staring at the soldiers. If you were smart, you'd leave too, he said, while well, you still have the chance. As Will spoke, a fit of coughing gripped the man by the fire. Sophie's heart hurt at the sight of him hunched over, struggling for breath. She left Will and walked up to the man with the dagger. He's sick, she said, nodding to the one by the fire. That he is, red fever. Your soldiers, Sophie said, from the Queen's army. The man gave her a menacing look. We ain't deserters, miss, if that's what you're about to say. We was good fighters, all of us, still would be if we was allowed. Why are you out here? Sophie asked. Too ashamed to be anywhere else, said the man in the makeshift chair. Fighting was my life. He looked down at his ruined legs. Who wants a soldier who can't march? The man, sitting by the fire, spoke. His head was down. He didn't bother to look up. They tossed us away when we were wounded like rubbish. Didn't they, Hans? The man with the dagger, Hans, nodded. But there's a hospital for wounded veterans, said Sophie, in Konigsberg. It's barracks now. We was told we cost the crown too much money, that we needed to make way for soldiers who were fit and could fight, Hans explained. The queen said this? Sophie asked, appalled but not surprised. The lord commander did, said it was the queen's orders. King Frederick, Sophie's father, had been a soldier. He died in battle, fighting against the king of the hinterlands. The hospital for the war wounded bore his name. He believed veterans were heroes and that they served the highest honor their country could give them. Never would he have allowed these men to be treated so badly. And neither will the king's daughter, Sophie said to herself. Sophie's heart, quiet all morning long, banged like a foundry now. The men all looked at her, alarmed by the noise, and then at Will. It's a clock, Will said. Hans looked baffled by his explanation, but Sophie didn't notice. She wasn't aware of anything except the swell of compassion in her heart for the wounded men. All they wanted was to be soldiers, to fight for queen and country. Instead, they'd been stripped of their dignity, robbed of their pride, and forced to hide themselves away in the dark wood. So Sophie took off her jacket and draped it over the shivering man's shoulders. The man looked at the warm garment that had suddenly appeared with surprise, and then he looked up at Sophie. I can't take this, miss. Yes, you can. She pulled Weber's blanket out of her rucksack and spread it over the ravaged legs of the man in the chair. It eased his suffering some. Zara nudged her head under the man's hand and he smiled. Next, Sophie pulled off her woolen cap and gently placed it on the head of the boy who'd lost his eyes. As she did, her long black hair tumbled free. Well, I'll be damned, Hans exclaimed, his voice an odd hush. It's you. I've seen you at drills and marches ever since you was a tiny girl. Sophie glanced at him, then nervously looked away. She shouldn't have removed her cap. She should have considered the consequences. It wasn't wise to reveal her identity. Not in Dronensburg, not to these strangers, and not to Will, but her heart had given her no choice, and it was too late to undo her actions now. I knew you wasn't dead. I never believed what the Queen said. Not for a minute, said Hans. I knew it was a lie. He looked at Will and frowned. Take that hat off, lad. Show some respect. Don't you know who this is? It was Will's turn to look baffled. Um, yeah, she's a girl. Sophie. Princess Sophia, to the likes of you, the soldier sniffled. He took Sophie's hand and kissed it. Will's eyes widened. He took a step back, not in awe, however, like the others, not with deference. You're on the run, aren't you? Hans asked. Sophie didn't reply. She thought it best not to say what she was doing or where she was going. Her stepmother's spies were everywhere. Of course you are. Why else would you be dressed like that, Hans continued. Don't worry, princess. Your secret's safe with us. Sophie squeezed the soldier's hands. Then she straightened and addressed all the men in what she hoped was a magisterial tone. 
I'll return for you, all of you, as soon as I can. You'll be taken back to Codingsburg and cared for, I promise. The men dipped their heads to her. They smiled. The smiles were polite but skeptical. Sophie could see they didn't believe her. Why would they? They'd undoubtedly heard what had been said about her at court. How could a weak young girl champion their cause against the decrees of a powerful queen? Sophie wished she could tell them about her plan, that she would be returning with the might of Scandinavia's army behind her, but they would find out soon enough. She would not forget them. Sophie took her leave. The soldiers wished her safe travels, and Will started walking again. It was quiet between them for some time. Then Will said, you're going to be cold tonight. I'll get another coat, Sophie said crisply. Silence descended again. Why didn't you tell me who you were, Will asked. How much further to the village, Sophie asked brusquely. So it's none of my business. I'm walking a dead princess to Grasseldorf, but I don't need to know why. No, you don't. He looked at the side of her face. Are you in trouble, Sophie? Yes, does that make you happy, Will? Will flinched, no, why would it? Because you despise me, you said so. Yes, I did. Sophie was surprised by his honest admission. It was not what she was used to. There were no denials, no excuses, no flowery words to perfume his earlier unpleasant ones. Sophie waited silently to give him time to make his apology, but he didn't. Finally, her patience gave out. You're not sorry for what you said, she asked huffily. Will frowned thoughtfully. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know yet. You should be. Your words were cruel. You don't even know me. You're right, I don't. Then he said, why are you going to Scandinay? I need to get to Prince Hakon, Sophie replied. I need his help to fight some powerful adversaries. She was about to ask him if he would help her, if he would take her to Hakon's palace. She didn't want to, not after what he'd said, but she was desperate. Before she could, though, he spoke. Who are you fighting, the queen? Can't you do it yourself? Sophie shot him a scalding look. Fight the queen of the Greenlands myself? No, Will. Funnily enough, I can't. Will smirked. Handsome princes certainly come in handy, don't they? Wish I had one. There was the mocking tone again. It made Sophie bristle. Hakon's my protector. We're betrothed, the prince and I. Hmm. Hmm? What's that you have to say? What does hmm mean? I heard that you were killed by wolves, that they dragged you off. You heard wrong. So I'm wondering. What? Sophie snapped. Why Prince Charming isn't searching for you? The same question had pricked at, Sophie's like, at Sophie like a thorn. She told Will what she'd been telling herself, because he believes I'm dead, just like you did. Even so, you'd think he'd want to find your skeleton, at least, to give his lost love a proper burial, maybe keep a finger bone for a little memento, some teeth, a few toes. Sophie stopped dead. Will did, too. Do you have to be so horrible? She asked angrily. He didn't search, Will said. He did. Then why didn't he find you, clever guy like him? He ran out of time. The queen sent him back to his realm. So why doesn't he come back? He could search for you disguised as a woodcutter or merchant. Sophie walked ahead of him, irate. She couldn't believe she'd ever considered asking this troll of a boy for help. Hakon has responsibilities. He has affairs of state to attend to. You just don't understand, she called over her shoulder. Will watched her as she stalked down the path and then quietly, so that she couldn't hear him, she said, neither do you. 39, Sophie groaned, she huffed, she kicked at some dead leaves. Will, a few yards up the road, paid her no attention. They'd trudged through the woods for six hours yesterday after they'd left the soldiers and almost 12 hours today, walking, making camp and breaking camp mostly in silence. Neither of them had talked much since their fight. Sophie was tired, her feet ached. She thought constantly, longingly, of her soft bed back at the hollow. The road sloped down now. It curved around the base of a hill, as it did an old church at the top of the hill, gray and decrepit, its bell tower crumbling, loomed into view. That's St. Sebastian's. The village is on the other side of it. Will called back to her. You can save a bit of time if we cut through the graveyard. Come on, he shot up the hill. Sophie followed him, but at a walk. Are you coming? Hurry up, Will shouted. He was already halfway to the church. 
Sophie rolled her eyes. She was still smarting from Will's harsh declaration. She still didn't know why he'd said that he despised her, and it wasn't likely that she would find out. She refused to give him the satisfaction of asking. Sophie had decided that she wasn't terribly keen on Will either, though she was grudgingly grateful to him. For someone who couldn't stand her, he took pains to help her. He'd made it his mission to teach her what she could and couldn't forage from the forest. In less than two days, she'd learned which mushrooms were poisonous, how to set a proper snare, and what forest plants were safe to eat. Pay attention, he'd insisted, as he showed her the difference between two types of swamp cabbage. Green leaf fills you, red leaf kills you. You need to know these things if you're going to make it to Scandinay. A shiver ran through Sophie now as she followed Will up the hill. She didn't like the look of the spooky old church or the notion of taking a shortcut through the graveyard, but the day was lengthening and she knew that Will wanted to get to the village before the shops closed. He intended to make his purchases and start back for his home before dusk fell. When she reached the top of the hill, she saw him walking through the grassy graveyard, past crypts, through rows of headstones. How much further? She asked breathlessly as she caught up with him. Watch it, you blockhead. You stepped on me. Sophie stopped dead. That was the last straw. What did you call me? She asked. I didn't call you anything, said Will. Sophie gave him a sharp look. Oh, really? Then who did? Will stopped, too, and turned in a circle, his eyes on the grass. What are you looking at? I don't see anything but mushrooms, Sophie said, pointing at a patch of fungi, sporting red caps with white polka dots. That's because mushrooms are what they want you to see. Who's they? Ground pixies. Ever wonder why mushrooms seem to pop up from the ground overnight, he asked. It's the pixies moving around. They wear red hats that look just like the mushroom caps as camouflage. Sophie bent down and stretched her hand out toward one. Be careful, they can be nasty, Will warned. Just as she was about to touch a spotted cap, it shot out of reach. The cap tilted back, a tiny face with a sharp nose and shrewd eyes appeared underneath. Hands to yourself, strudel brain, the pixie said. Sophie gasped. The little man was standing before her, wearing a white tunic and green clogs. He had pointy ears and sharp teeth. You shouldn't call people names, scolded Will. Says who, cabbage head? You're the rudest little thing, Sophie sputtered, straightening. I should cook you and eat you. The pixie made a rude gesture. Eat that, fart sack. Will burst into laughter. Sophie did not. She stamped her foot at the pixie, but instead of running away, he and ten more of his kind charged at her, snapping their teeth. She gave a shrill cry and ran behind Will. You think Cuggle Boy here is going to protect you? The pixie scoffed. Please. He sucked his lower jaw in to give himself buck teeth, stuck his neck way out and imitated Will's loping walk. Hey, said Will, scowling, that's not funny. But Sophie thought it was hilarious. She couldn't stop giggling. Zara, meanwhile, had walked up to one of the pixies and had nudged it with her snout. This infuriated the creature. He kicked dirt in her face. Don't breathe your smelly dog breath all over me, you stupidly legged, bug-eyed, bony-ass flea bag. Zara took a step back. She barked uncertainly. Then she lunged at the pixie, grabbed it by its cap, and shook it violently. The strap that held its cap on its head snapped, and the pixie went flying through the air, trailing a string of obscenities. Zara ripped the cap to shreds. It was a mistake. A good 50 of the creatures ran out from the long grass, yelling at the top of their lungs. Um, well, I think we made them mad, Sophie said, backing away. We sure did. Time to go, said Will. They turned and started to walk away. Sophie looked over her shoulder. The pixies kept coming. They were gaining on them. Their teeth looked very sharp indeed. She tugged on Will's sleeve. Will glanced behind himself. We're in trouble, he said. Where's the handsome prince when you need him? Guess you'll have to make do with a handsome princess, Sophie said, impulsively catching hold of his hand. Will's hand closed on hers and Sophie pulled him along. They broke into a trot, laughing with each other this time. Zara, her ears flapping, loped along behind them. Sophie didn't let go, not until they were out of the graveyard, down the hill and well on the road to Grosseldorf. Neither did Will. 40. Grosseldorf was a gray and dreary. It was as gray and dreary as the gravestones Sophie had passed in the churchyard, and she couldn't wait to leave it. 
She had to be patient, though. Will was in the apothecary's shop. He'd buttonholed the owner as he was locking up and had persuaded him to open again for just a few minutes. He couldn't wait until morning, he explained to the man. He had to get back on the road. Someone was waiting for him, someone who needed what he'd come to buy. Sophie's ears had pricked up at this. He was so closed-mouthed about his family, his whole life, that she was sure he hadn't meant for her to hear all that. But she had. Who's the someone, she wondered. Will does have a... Does Will have a wife? Her heart had sunk noisily at the idea of Will being married. Clock, Will had said as the shopkeeper unlocked the door. Clock, Sophie had replied, smiling brightly. Will had followed the man inside, and Sophie had lingered in the street, waiting for the noise to stop, but to her mortification it continued, shifting down into an ugly, low hissing. She didn't understand why, and then glancing in through the windows at Will, she did. Her heart was jealous. That realization shocked her. It made no sense. What did she care if Will was married? She was soon going to be reunited with her beloved. That was the only thing that mattered. She wasn't jealous. How could she be? She didn't even like Will, and he certainly didn't like her. It was just her strange, unfathomable clockwork malfunctioning heart again. A moment later, the noise stopped, and Sophie and Zara joined Will inside the shop. Sophie didn't want to be there. She was, an impati was impatient to get out of Rosseldorf as Will was. She felt exposed here. What if Kraus was out looking for her and rode through the village, but Will made her wait? There was a public house on the edge of the village, he said, a rough one, and he didn't want her awake walking past it alone. As Sophie wandered around in the shop, she looked at the jars lining the walls. Some contained wonderfully fragrant things like cinnamon, cloves, and nutmeg. Others contained substances that made her wrinkle her nose, like dried black beetle and pickled toad. Two ounces of elder tree bark, two of fox nettle, and an ounce of ground barberry, she heard Will say. Sophie knew what these things were for. What she didn't know was why he was buying them. The apothecary finished measuring out Will's order, folded the substances into squares of brown paper, and pushed them across the counter. Will paid the man and then carefully tucked his purchases into his rucksack. They made it to a few more shops before they closed. Will bought a few things at each one and then tucked four plums, some bread, and a hunk of cheese into Sophie's rucksack. She tried to thank him, but he wouldn't let her. Instead, he lectured her yet again on the differences between Stagley, which was delicious, and Stag Wart, which would turn her tongue blue. Sophie listened dutifully as they walked past the shuttered shops. But when Will paused to take a breath, she said, why all the painkillers? She didn't get an answer, so she shot Will a sideways glance. His jaw was set hard. I guess it's none of my business, she said. I guess not. They continued their walk in silence until the buildings fell away. Sophie could see a fork in the road up ahead and to the left of it, just as Will said, an unsavory looking pub. Sophie had to pick her steps carefully in places. A farmer had clearly recently through, been recently been through with his cows. The animals had left plenty of cow pats in the road. A few men idled in a handful of rickety wooden tables at the pump's porch. More came out to join them, pints in their hands. Gusts of raucous laughter burst through the open doors after them. Will, his hands jammed into his trouser pockets, glanced at them. Sophie didn't. If she had, she would have noticed that they were wearing navy blue uniforms. But she was staring hard at the road, trying to keep her unruly heart under control. She could feel it starting to thump. She hoped it wasn't going to embarrass her again. A moment later, they reached the fork. Will inhaled deeply and then blew a heavy breath out. He shifted his weight from one foot to the other. And then all in a rush, he said, I wish you weren't going alone. I'd go with you, Sophie. I want to, but I can't. There's someone at home. She needs me, and I've got to get back. Once again, Sophie's heart began making a low, ratchety clatter. She started talking, a little louder than usual, to cover up the sound. There's no need to apologize, Will. I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for you. I can never thank you enough for all of the help you've given me. I'll be fine. Well, I guess this is it. I guess so. Awkwardly, Sophie extended her hand, thinking Will would take it, shake it, kiss it, something, even though he didn't like her, if only for courtesy's sake. Instead, he hugged her. It was awkward and stiff. He patted her back too hard as if they were she were a horse or a big dog and he 
held her for a beat too long, which brought a cat call from the direction of the pub, a few whistles too, and a rude comment. Sophie broke the hug. She darted a glance at the man who'd made the rude comment and sucked in her teeth. The rude man had just been lifting his pint of ale to his lips. He lowered it, his eyes locked on Sophie's. He knew her, and she knew him. He was the captain of the Queen's Guard. 41. Sophie's heart clanged in her chest. Will gave her an uncertain smile. Hmm, that's not just any old clock in your pocket, is it? It's an alarm clock, he joked. Sophie pushed him away. Go back to the village, she hissed, and then she headed up the road as fast as she could. Will caught up to her. Sophie, is something wrong? Pretend you don't know me, Sophie said, breaking into a trot. It's a little late for that. I just hugged you, Will said, hurrying to keep up with her. Sophie cast a glance over her shoulder back at the pub. Go, Will, please, before they hurt you. Will followed the direction of her gaze. They both saw the captain put his glass down. He motioned two of his men over. Is this the trouble you're in? Will asked. Some of it. There's a farm up ahead, just off the road, Will said tersely. If we cut through its meadows, we can reach the hill to St. Sebastian's where we came in. The dark woods on the other side. If we can get to it, we can lose them. Sophie's eyes, still in the captain, were huge in her face. Sophie, Will barked at her. Look at me. Me, not him. Sophie did so. His gray eyes looked as hard as steel. Hey there, girl, the captain shouted. You ready, Will said. He took hold of her hand. Sophie nodded. Will tightened his grip, and an instant later, they were running like the wind. I'll start with chapter 42 in our next recording.